Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us um, and welcome to the donor education series uh, being hosted by the Missoula Community Foundation. The foundation works as a connector and educator and a funder here in Missoula. Um, my name is Marcy Allen. I'm the executive director of the foundation. And our mission is to enhance community vitality by inspiring community giving and strengthening nonprofits. We hope that this education series serves as an increased awareness about philanthropy in our community. Um, and it's my pleasure to introduce you to our speaker today. I would like to introduce Julie Sears, who will be representing, um, presenting on changing tax laws and how they affect uh, philanthropic gifts here in Montana. And Julie is one of our amazing board members. Um, and she's also a an attorney at Boone Carlberg here in Missoula. Um, Julie was an analyst for the Defense Intelligence Agency in Washington, D.C., and moved to Montana with her husband and children in 2006. Um, she graduated with high honors from the University of Montana School of Law and has served as a board member for a number of other local nonprofit organizations. So I'm really excited to have her here and um, to listen more about this topic because there's lots of changes that are going on. Um, I just want to cover a few Zoom etiquette um things before we get started and um i um if you could just please turn off your volume everyone's volumes off thank you um and your video off however if you feel so inclined you may turn your video on um during the q a portion of the um presentation if you have questions at any point during the press presentation, please type them into the chat, which can be found at the bottom of your screen. Um, all questions will be answered at the end of the presentation during the Q&A session. If anything is like really pressing about a current topic, I'll be monitoring that chat and can ask Julie those questions. Um, please note that this event is being recorded and will be shared with donors who were not able to attend today. Um, without further ado, I'll pass it on to Julie. All right, thank you, Marcy, and thank you to Kirsten, who's been in the background, very helpful in this process with the Missoula Community Foundation. And thank you to all of you attending today uh, who are interested in, in charitable giving and also tax laws. I, after graduating from U of M Law School, I did an additional tax law degree at the University of Washington in Seattle. So I love talking about tax, but it's not often that I get a captive audience who's going to get to hear me uh, talk about that as well. So I admire all of you for expressing an interest in that. But before we, we start uh, into the sort of the nitty gritty details of what's been going on with the tax laws in recent years and what we may be looking at in the near future, I wanted us to take a step back and give some thought to how the public policy of charitable giving really fits in with the tax law. As all of you probably know, there was not always an income tax in the United States. It's a relatively recent development, just a little over a, a hundred years old, at least in its current iteration. And when it was uh, first put into to practice, at least in the, the modern, more modern era, Charitable deductions, in, in other words, a deduction for, for amounts given to charity, were allowed to all taxpayers as a deduction on their taxes. And the theory behind this is that taxes in part pay for public goods that could be considered charitable in nature. And therefore, to the extent that Americans are giving to those charities directly, it's sort of like it's saving the government money. And, and in a sense, and therefore people should be encouraged to do that because it means that there's less that the government needs to do. And it's also a way in a very sort of small d democratic sense, a way to make sure that Americans are able to prioritize what they want to donate money to. So rather than the government deciding what types of benefits should be given, and of course there is still some of that, but the idea that Americans should be incentivized to give to organizations that they care about to provide goods for individuals in, in a way that the government then maybe necessarily wouldn't need to. And so that's the theory behind why it, it's appropriate to have a deduction for charitable giving. 
And as I said in the very beginning, everyone got one. But then that started to change a little bit in beginning in 1944 when what's known as the standard deduction was introduced. And this doesn't have anything to do directly with charitable giving, but it had the effect of disincentivizing a portion of taxpayers from making charitable gifts because they would no longer be able to deduct those. So many of you probably know what the standard deduction is. Basically, if your income does not exceed what your standard deduction would be, you don't owe anything in taxes, or uh, if you uh, have deductions that are less than the standard deduction, then you wouldn't be what's called itemizing those deductions and getting to take them off of your income for tax purposes. But instead, you would just take the standard deduction and whatever other deductible expenses you may have made during the year wouldn't matter. So currently, for example, the standard deduction is $12,550 for an individual, twice that for a married couple filing jointly and and other uh, options, depending on if you're head of household or, or married, filing separately. But again, it's it's that idea that as we'll go on in this presentation today is, is really important to sort of wrap your head around because if you take the standard deduction, then tax code provisions that require you to itemize your deductions really aren't an incentive to you anymore. So beginning in, in 1944, an increasing number of Americans really weren't able to deduct their charitable donations because they no longer itemized those donations. So it didn't really matter to them from a tax perspective whether or not they made donations to charity. Nevertheless, there were still a substantial number of Americans from 1944 on until about 2017 at least it did still qualify to itemize their deductions and therefore were incentivized, incentivized to give to charity. Um, but in 2017, there was a major change in the tax law, which many of you are probably aware of, and it was called the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. I'll Sometimes you see it as TCJA, or I'll often refer to it as just the 2017 law, but that's what I'm talking about. And it didn't really do much specifically related to the, uh, the tax laws governing charitable or nonprofit organizations. And, and in some ways, it actually increased the incentive for certain high income taxpayers who, who would donate to charity. Prior to the 2017 law, uh, taxpayers could only deduct from their income up to 50% of their adjusted gross income. And under the 2017 law, that was increased to 60%. And this law, this rule did apply to all taxpayers, but the reason it's generally considered only to have uh, affected the, the taxpayers and probably the higher income brackets is that most American taxpayers aren't able to donate half or more of their income to, to charitable organizations, but instead they live off of that income. So it's, you know, the relatively few that have maybe a high enough income or other sources that they, uh, you know, other sources of, of support that they live off of that could donate um, to that extent. And so it really didn't affect a lot of people, didn't get a lot of attention. But what did in the 2017 law really have a profound impact in terms of the incentive structure in the tax code for Americans was the change to the number of Americans who could itemize. And I'll get into that detail in just a minute, but basically in a big picture sense, what it did was reduce the number of Americans who could itemize. So in other words, were incentivized to donate to charity, incentivized by the tax code at least, by an estimated 28 and a half million individuals. So prior to the 2017 law, about 30% of American taxpayers qualified to itemize um, on their tax returns and, and therefore typically would have a deduction for any charitable contributions they would make. And that number then now dropped to about 10% only of Americans who qualify. So that really removed that incentive structure from many millions of Americans. And to talk about how it did that, and, and this is this kind of gets into the weeds of, of tax law, uh, but it's important to understand because this 
feeds into some of the changes that may be happening now in the relatively near future and, and also explains why certain strategies work better than others in terms of, of overcoming some of these disincentives if you still want to do your charitable giving in a way that, that gives you sort of a maximum tax advantage. So what the, the 2017 law did is a couple of things. Um, one, it doubled uh, the, or roughly doubled the standard deduction. So as I mentioned earlier, currently, and these numbers are usually adjusted for inflation. So for this year, 2021, the standard deduction is 12,550 for single filers. And then the, the other probably second most common filing status is for married filing jointly. And that deduction is then double what it is for singles or 25,100. Um, and even a little higher if, if you're 65 or older or if you're legally blind. And, the, and so that deduction, by raising the standard deduction, it meant that fewer people would have enough deductions to itemize their taxes to begin with. But then the 2017 law also made it harder to fully take all of your deductions by capping the so-called SALT deduction. And what SALT stands for is the state and local tax deduction. So that was for example, state income tax is, is typically uh, a deduction that you can take on your taxes if, if you itemize. Um, and local taxes, which in practice for most taxpayers means their property taxes. That was the amount that you could deduct was capped at $10,000, not only for single filers, but even for, for married couples. So usually, you know, a, a, a married couple, even if they're filing separately or if they're filing jointly, they get roughly, roughly twice the amount that a, a single filer would in terms of deduction caps. But this, this was an unusual cap in that it, it was at 10,000, both for individuals who filed as singles and also individuals who filed as married. And the way this worked also had the effect of like I said before, reducing your ability to itemize, but I thought it would be helpful to kind of run through an example to, to understand how this works. So let's say you have, let's say there's a married couple and they together have 15,000 that they've paid in state income taxes over the years. Typically you know, that could qualify as a deduction in full before the 2017 law. And let's say they also have $5,000 a year that they pay in property taxes. So normally that would be 20,000 that they could have is that portion of their deductions, getting them already pretty close to that 25,000 sum that would allow them to qualify to itemize. But under the SALT cap, they can now only for those you know, two items combined, the, the state taxes and then their property taxes, they can only deduct 10,000. So let's say that same couple also had $10,000 in mortgage interest if they otherwise would you know, that they would still be eligible to itemize, if they had been able to combine that with their 20,000 in earlier deductions, they would have 30,000 total. They would, it would be to, the, to their advantage to itemize their tax deductions to take that full 30. And then any dollar that that couple spent in terms of making a, a charitable or nonprofit donation during the year, they would also qualify to, to deduct that. But with the cap, with the SALT cap, uh, now they can only take that 10,000 for that one portion of their deductions. And even if they add that to their 10,000 in deductible mortgage interest, they're still at 20,000. So if, so they really don't have any incentive anymore to get a tax advantage through deductibility for making charitable contributions. And so that's how that change, you know, those two changes combined, the, the higher standard deduction and then also the, the cap on the state and local taxes really worked to disadvantage taxpayers who wanted to deduct their charitable contributions. And there was um, a sort of a, a lesser known and, and, and I would say arguably uh, less, less drastic um, effect through the 2017 law as well in terms of reducing the tax incentives for charitable giving for, for millions of additional Americans. And that was simply decreasing the tax rates. So 
many of the tax brackets saw a reduction in their rates. For example, the 28% bracket went down to 24%. And if you're a, a taxpayer who really likes to figure out how much you're saving through each do donation, you would look at what that same amount uh, might be, be taxed to you as. So if you, in, in a simple example, were to give $100 that, that you can now deduct from your income as a result of it being a dedu deductible charitable donation, if you were in the 28% bracket before, um, that's, you know, it, that's if you had kept that money, you'd be paying an extra $28 in taxes. Now, if you're in only a 24% bracket, then, then you're calculating only that you'd be paying $24 if you didn't otherwise donate it and, and were able to deduct it. So probably not a, a huge difference, at, at least in relatively small amounts, but again, sort of a subtle disincentive in, in, in terms of when, when tax brackets are higher, it, you're in a sense getting kind of more bang for your buck for your charitable deductions. And when all of this occurred, you know, there wasn't a lot, as many of you probably remember, much discussion of how this might impact nonprofit organizations, because these were changes in the tax code that didn't directly target them, that just really, in a sense, had the effect of, of doing so in terms of reducing the number of people who could deduct their charitable contributions. And there was some uncertainty at the time of how was this going to affect charitable donations nationwide, because Americans, as you probably know, are among the most generous people of, of any country in, in terms of the amount that we donate to charity. And it turns out that charitable donations have continued to grow in, in the ensuing years. And so it's curious to, uh, or interesting to, to try to figure out why that is. And I think the number one reason is that a lot of Americans don't realize that they have to some extent been disincentivized from making charitable deductions. I think if you ask most Americans, even those Americans who before the 2017 tax law changes, uh, if you ask them, are they able to deduct their charitable donations, they'd probably say yes. <laughs> a lot of nonprofits even mentioned that in some of their literature, you know, make a tax deductible contribution. And, and many Americans then when, when they make that contribution just sort of assume it and, and don't really get into the details of their tax returns, even perhaps to some extent if they're preparing them themselves or if they're having a paid preparer do it, to realize that, that for many of them, even before the 2017 law, there actually wasn't a tax deduction. And so, you know, going from, from that level to the millions of more Americans who are now taking the standard deduction and not itemizing, again, it probably hasn't really dawned on people that they're not getting that deduction that, that, that some of them at least might have been before all of this. And of course, there are also, and probably most importantly, other reasons that are important to people for making nonprofit or donations to nonprofits and that they believe in the purpose of whatever organization they're donating to. And that of course hasn't changed. Um, and of course too, the economy, the economy has been relatively good, especially the stock market over the last, you know, quite a few years now. And in a generally good economy, more Americans feel comfortable making charitable donations. So even though this, um, this change was pretty major in, in terms of the deductibility and therefore the incentive of Americans to make charitable donations, it really doesn't seem to have much, have had much of an effect. But if you're aware of this change and you like the idea of still having that incentive to make charitable donations and get some sort of tax benefit from it, there are some strategies that you can employ. And that's what we'll look through now and then go through uh, some of the potential changes and how you can strategize around that too. So the first potential strategy is what's often referred to as bunching, which is just combining charitable donations that you might make over a number of years into one year to basically get you up to the, the point where you're beyond that standard deduction, overcoming uh, some of the obstacles like the salt cap or the increase in the standard deduction um, by, by doing this bunching strategy. So an example of how it would work is let's say you're a married couple filing a joint return 
Uh, you're dealing with your salt cap of, of $10,000, even if you really would have more deductions than that. And let's say you have mortgage interest of, of $12,000 in this example, and you typically give $2,000 total uh, per year to a variety of nonprofits. So that would get this, the couple in this example, a total of potential deductions of 24,000. But uh, as I mentioned earlier, the, uh, the standard deduction for, for a married couple is 25,100 in this year. So they wouldn't qualify to itemize. They'd, they'd take the standard deduction. There's really no tax benefit to them of giving that uh, $2,000 that they normally do in this year. But if they double their annual giving from say 2,000 to 4,000, now they have a total eligible deductions of 26,000. And so they basically itemize all their deductions at this point. And you know, that can give uh, these taxpayers the sense that those charitable uh, donations are all qualifying um, for them to reduce their taxes, they get the sense that they're benefiting from it in addition to making these donations presumably to organizations they care about. But what, what doesn't work as well in this strategy is if they've simply, you know, given the, the subsequent year's donation in this particular year, and then they give nothing in, in the following year, that might feel oddly to a, a number of taxpayers who like to have steady giving or like the flexibility to decide as time goes on, which organizations they're going to donate to in a, in a given year rather than just kind of bunching all those donations in a particular year and having you know, maybe no donations then in the following year. So a solution to this is through a vehicle called donor advised funds. And many of you have probably heard of these. They were certainly popular, I would even say increasingly popular before the changes in the tax laws. But they're also a good vehicle to kind of use this bunching strategy, but in a way that allows you to still have some continuity of giving. So basically, if you say, using this example of, of that couple from the prior slide, Say this same couple donated uh, 4, 000, that $4,000 to a donor advised fund. They would get that full $4,000 uh, deductible donation in the year that they made it, but they would be able to distribute it over time. Um, and so in that way, they could, if, if they were used to giving, for example, uh, $2,000 a year, they could, they could bunch that donation, get the tax deductibility in that year one, but then make those donations just as they, they always did um, in partly year one and year two in that example. And what's nice about this, so, so and I suspect some of you listening to this may already be involved in a donor advised fund. These are usually through some sort of investment company. You work with an investment advisor, uh, you make a, a donation and, and then decide over time where which organizations are going to receive that, that the uh, amounts are invested in, in the meantime and so therefore hopefully grow. And part of the reason I found just in my own practice working with uh, families who want to, to do some charitable planning um, is that these sorts of donor advised funds can be a helpful vehicle, somewhat similar to family foundations, but a lot simpler to administer. And I think that contributes to part of their popularity um, over, over time, somewhat increasingly. But also, it's, it's, they're a helpful vehicle for these strategies if you want to you know, kind of maximize your charitable deductions um, with, your, with your giving and, and also getting these tax advantages while you do. They're also, because these donor advised funds are through uh, investment companies, they can be a good vehicle for donating appreciated stock. And this, this is a strategy that's not uh, you know, specific to the changes from the 2017 tax law, but is one that, that is 
you know, still taxed advantage before the law currently, and, and particularly with some changes that might be coming. So I thought it'd be a good idea. Again, something that, that all of, or that some of you may well know already, but I thought an example for, for what I'm talking about in terms of donating appreciated stock or really any appreciated asset can work um, to look at an example for that. So you, if you give a, a you know, some, some number of shares of stock, you get a, a charitable deduction for the fair market value of that stock at the time of the donation, and you don't need to recognize gain. And this can have a real tax advantage uh, for an individual who wants to make a donation like this. So again, using very simple numbers, let's say uh, some, the, the shares of stock that you're donating now were originally purchased for $10, and they're now worth 100. So that's $90 of gain, which if you were to make that donation in cash, you would first need to sell the stock, recognize the gain, the $90 in gain. And if that were taxed at fairly typical 15% capital gain rates, that would be taxed of, in, in that simple example, $13.50. But then if you still gave the $100 to charity, really now you're kind of out. Um, you know, that, that additional $13.50 of tax that you're having to pay first. So the advantage of giving any sort of appreciated act, asset or the stock in this example is if you donate it directly, you receive the full $100 donation and you haven't had to recognize or pay tax on the gain that's there in the meantime. So another strategy that can be helpful in trying to make sure that you uh, are giving enough in order to qualify to itemize so that you get the benefit of that charitable donation deduction is simply to give more, <laughs> you know, just, just give more. Uh, kind of like that, that couple in, in the first example where if they doubled their charitable donations from 2000 to 4000, they would qualify to itemize and in a sense get that tax incentive for that full amount that can work for, for anyone, <laughs> but it's, um, and, and certainly something that I suspect most nonprofit organizations would be happy to have people just give more. So you, you make it over whatever the, the standard deduction is in, in your uh, tax profile and, and give that extra to, to charity and, and know that you're getting the tax benefit for it. But that can be a little complicated too, um, because you have to know how much it's going to take to get you over that point. Um, so for example, you know, it's not everyone's necessarily going to know until the following year, maybe what their total deductions were for the prior year, uh, what, um, what, what the various factors in their, their tax return may have been to, to get them where they need to be, how much of charitable giving they would need to, to give, for, for example, to get them over over the limit of whatever that standard deduction is. So it can be a great strategy, just plan on giving more to, to charity, maybe if you need to get yourself over that limit, but it probably works best as a planning strategy for those taxpayers who have um, relatively few year-to-year -year individual tax changes, especially relatively fixed deductible expenses, then it's probably easier to figure out on a year-to-year -year basis as opposed to the following year when you're actually sitting down and trying to work on your tax return. Um, so for, for example, the example there in that slide is if, um, again, in just a simple sense, if you're a, a married couple that has $22,000 in deductions, then in order to, to qualify to, have, to make use of the, the charitable giving deduction, they would want to give at least $3,101 uh, to get them into that itemization category. Another helpful strategy um, that, that's again, kind of like the uh, donations of, of appreciated assets like stocks that existed before and, and continues to exist now and, and likely will even in any future tax changes is the idea of, of an IRA rollover directly to charity. So it's, again, this is something many of you may have already probably used. It's particularly helpful in 
dealing with required minimum distributions in that you can, rather than take that distribution into your income and having to report it as income on your tax return, you can make the donation directly to charity, get the deduction without having to first include it in your income. And while in some stand circumstances, the, the deduction and the, and the income inclusion um, could be helpful, uh, in, in some cases it's not, it, it doesn't even evenly kind of cancel each other out. So the ability to donate directly to the charity can have tax advantages as well as just more simplicity for individuals who like that option. All right, so the 2017 law also made some pretty profound um, changes to uh, charitable planning that people might do, uh, you know, planning on, on their own passing as, as part of their estate plan. And again, nothing that, that really targeted it directly, but by changing the number of people who, who needed to do that, that sort of planning or who were incentivized to do it for tax purposes, it dramatically reduced the number. So the 2017 law basically doubled what's often referred to as the unified exclusion amount. Currently now that for, for this year, and, and it also is indexed for inflation, it's about 11.7 .7 million. So just under 12 million under, you know, before the changes in the 2017 law, it would have been half of that. So just under 6 million. And this, like I mentioned, is adjusted for inflation. So it generally goes up over time. And there, this is still in the context of unlimited transfers at death between spouses. So this is for um, estates where, where it's not, you know, where the whole estate isn't simply going to the, the surviving spouse, but for, you know, those estates that, that would, be, would be having uh, substantial distributions to, to non-spouses as well. Um, this is a provision under the 2017 law that's uh, set to sunset in the year 2026, so it's not a permanent change. So that's, even, even if it doesn't change under um, some of the, the current potential changes to tax law, if it's just left alone, then it would sunset in 2026 anyway. But the impact that it really had on charitable giving and on estate planning in general is that reduced taxable estates that even under the old law were only about 1% of all estates to an estimated less than 0.1% of estates. In other words, it's, it's very rare, relatively speaking, to have an estate that's more than about 11.7 .7 million that isn't all going to a spouse. Um, but if you are one of these estates that's looking at a pot potential taxable portion, and so the, the taxable portion is Usually um, it, it's somewhat graduated, but it can be as high as 40% of, of whatever gets above that limit. So that is a pretty high amount that does incentivize people to, to try to plan to avoid uh, that, those taxes if, if possible. But um, it similar, well, for a different reason though, but Similar to some of the other tax law changes from the 2017 law, it reduced the incentive uh, for people to make charitable donations because that, that reduces the taxable estate. Uh, and by having fewer estates affected by that, it wasn't really necessary for those who were doing the planning to consider charitable giving as an optional way to reduce those tax liabilities. So looking at the uh, potential changes that could be headed our way now, probably the most likely one, and, and it's, it's hard to um, you know, talk about this with any certainty because everything's still very much in process. We don't have any sort of final bill that's on its way, but most likely uh, if, if there are going to be major tax changes, it's likely to be in that estate area and simply go back to uh, the, the estate tax limit that was in place prior to the 2017 law, which like I said, is about half of what it is now. Um, so that would likely capture a number, uh, a greater number of estates that might then be incentivized to look at 
doing some charitable planning to reduce what would otherwise be the taxable portion of their estates. Also, there's, there's been a fair amount of discussion on increasing capital gains rates, which like that example that we went through with the donation of appreciated stock or, or any sort of asset that would have uh, capital gains kind of inherent in it that, that the, the donor would otherwise want to avoid recognizing the higher the capital gains rates are, the really the more incentive there is to structure a donation with that sort of appreciated asset to really get the benefit of not having to first recognize that in income. Uh, the IRA direct to charity rollover is likely to remain. I don't think I've heard anything about that changing. Um, and probably though the biggest change though, again, not, uh, not being directed one, one way or the other at charities, uh, charitable donations specifically, but it's, uh, a, a real push to try to have that uh, salt uh, cap removed. And what I found interesting is part of the push for this is coming even from those who, are, who identify uh, the most as, as some of the more progressive members and, and who tend to be a little more uh, maybe aggressive on taxation, but really don't like this um, Salt cap because essentially it, it makes it harder for individuals to um, well it, it disqualifies them from deducting the full amount that prior to the 2017 law they were able to deduct and the graphic there on that on the slide here shows you that that the individuals that it hit were those who lived in areas with a combination of relatively high state income taxes and then also relatively high uh, property taxes, and, and those tend to be in, in certain uh, particularly coastal areas of the U.S., but if, you, if you're able to see and kind of take a close look there at Montana, you can see that, and just because it's a little hard to read that graphic, basically the, the darker blue the area is on the map, the, the harder that salt cap hit individuals. So you see there's a big swath up the California coast um, there and, and you know looks like probably the Portland and, and area as well. And then in the Northeast, there's a big dark blue section. But if you look closely at Montana, you can, you can see the shape of Missoula County, for example, um, Gallatin's there. You know, there are a number of places where, where this also had a, a, a truly negative effect on taxpayers, um, e even in a place like Montana, which is not what you usually uh, hear about is having been affected negatively by that change. So there's a decent chance that that uh, will be a, a reform in any sort of new tax law. And it would make some of this strategizing less necessary if individuals are simply able to fully deduct what they had been able to deduct before, and which would qualify more of them to itemize and reintroduce that incentive for charitable giving to more individuals. So there are also some strategies that um, are, and, and some of them like we've dis discussed throughout this presentation, that are helpful kind of regardless of what happens. And, and some, some strategies that you may want to consider that will work just as well, regardless of, of what happens with the tax law. So one of those would be some sort of formula cause in a will or a trust or whatever your major um, a state planning document is that simply says something to the effect of if, if there's a taxable portion of this estate, it would go to one or more non qualifying nonprofit organizations, qualifying charitable organizations, according to the IRS, something like 501c3s usually. Um, now, depending on what the law is, that could be a much larger portion. So if you have currently an estate that's you know, maybe about 13 million that's not going to qualify for that full deduction to a surviving spouse. And you put one of these formula clauses in, uh, if the, the tax law stays the way it is, the, the estate exemption is close to 12 million, then you're maybe giving about a million to charity in that example. If the exclusion amount get, goes back down to half of what it is now, more what it was prior to 2017, 
then in, in that example, you'd suddenly be giving maybe 7 million to charity. So you do want to keep that in mind, make sure you're comfortable with what the outcome of that might be, but that is a relatively simple formula you could put in a will. If, if what you're really trying to get at is avoid any, avoiding any sort of federal estate tax, and it's important to mention in Montana, we don't have an inheritance tax, but that's not true for, for all states. So some states, individuals at much lower levels of estate value still are facing some sort of tax on the estate level, but in Montana, we're just focused on the federal estate tax amount, and so we can plan with, with that in mind. Also, it's important to, we've been talking mainly, of, well, really solely about the federal tax uh, law, but there are incentives built into, um, built into state tax law, particularly in Montana. Um, a number of you, I imagine, are already somewhat familiar with Montana's charitable endowment tax credit. I know Kirsten just prepared a great one pager on that that has uh, some, some examples showing really the, the impressive tax savings you can get from taking advantage of something like that. So even if the, the federal law seems uncertain or has changes that provide some sort of or, or reduce the incentive, I should say, to charitable giving. Don't forget that some states, and I know Montana is not alone in this, fortunately Montana is a great example of it, do have their own state-based incentives that can still provide um, you know, some, some great tax benefits for individuals who are inclined to do some charitable giving. And as I mentioned throughout the presentation, some of the current strategies are likely to still be helpful for a variety of tax and non-tax reasons, regardless of what happens at the federal level such as donor advised funds, um, lifetime do donations generally, and, and of course, just giving more <laughs> would be great. Um, but I wanted to, to mention with the lifetime donations, because it probably wasn't specifically clear from some of what I said. So when we're talking about the number of estates that are subject to tax, in other words, you pass away, your property, any asset of yours is valued. And if, if your estate is quite substantial, then you may be subject to some federal tax. But even before the changes in the tax law, as I mentioned, that hit only about 1% of estates. So there were far more people who don't have to worry about it than people who are dealing with uh, you know, the potential for some income tax benefits by charitable giving during their, their lifetimes. And that's certainly very true now. So you may well not be worried about what portion of your estate may be taxable upon your passing, but you could very likely get some tax advantages by giving during your lifetime in, in addition to hopefully the, the greater satisfaction of being around to see your donation doing some good work. So that's something to keep in mind too, that if, if you're doing some planned giving, definitely keep in mind doing some of that giving during your lifetime because it can have a, a very positive impact from a tax perspective for you probably for most Americans more so than if they gave it their death. So certainly leaving a legacy for a number of reasons is, is a great idea too. All right. Well, I think, uh, I think I might've given us a few additional minutes for questions. Um, I think we were thinking 10 to 15 and we're right at 15 now. So I'm not able to see the the chat, I don't think, but I believe Marcy is going to step in and, and moderate this portion. And I look forward to, to hearing your questions. Thank you all. Thanks, Julie. That was great. I have, I have a lot of thoughts and, <laughs> yeah. uh, and um, questions myself. Um, but if, you, if anybody that's participating would like to ask a question, please um, turn on your video and unmute yourself. Um, I did, I'll, I'll start. I have one question. So as an estate planner, as you're talking with clients who um, potentially could be impacted by um, the changing estate limit um, in 2026, what does that conversation look like when they're developing their sort of will or trust? And um, is philanthropy always the answer there? Or are there other avenues that um, some people like to take? Yeah, so in, in, in my um, discussions with clients who are most concerned about the, the, 
potential changes. They're they're looking not so much to 2026, but what might happen in 2022. Mm -hmm. um, in terms, well, because in, in 2026, even if nothing happens, there there would be the, the sunset where everything would basically go back to about half of what it is now. And like I mentioned in the presentation, there's there's a really decent chance that that could happen in 2022 also. So we've sort of accelerated that discussion to now. And there are a variety of, um, of strategies you can use to, to reduce your, your tax burden. Some of the, the simplest um, that, that people are considering now is to make a gift during life to the people that they intended to leave those amounts to at their death. So when, you know, I refer to that, what I often call just the estate tax limit, but it's actually the unified credit, meaning that the amount of, you know, otherwise taxable gifts is, is at the same level. And if you, you know, if, if you were to, again, just using simple numbers, I know it's a little less than 12 million, but if you were to make a 12, you know, gift, 12 million in this year, you would use up all of that unified credit. But if it essentially gets rid of most of your estate, say you have an income stream or, or not a, a need for, for a lot of that money, then you could make use of that entire credit um, as opposed to if you wait until the law changes, you, would, you could only make 6 million in, in gifts um, either during life or at death. So for some people who who have an estate between say six and 12 million, there is an incentive to just give that away, even if it's not to a charitable organization, but just get that out of their estate. Now, the, the downside of that is by uh, whenever you you gift to, uh, I mean, the, the same is, is true for, for charitable giving, but it doesn't really have a, a practical tax impact. But when you make a gift, say to a non-charitable person, um, just a regular individual, in other words, uh, they take your transferred tax basis. So, you know, think back to that example we did with the appreciated stock. If, if that were given to, say, your child um, as a gift during life, then they would have that, that $10 basis. If they were to sell it, they would have that $90 in gain. Whereas if if they were to inherit it at your passing, then they inherit it typically at the fair market value. There was some discussion initially with some of these tax law changes of maybe limiting the amount of that, it was often referred to as the stepped up basis rule that an individual would get at death where basically that gain disappears. Um, but that doesn't look likely to be made in, into law now. So that would kind of change some of the considerations. But I see a lot of people um, exploring gifting or exploring putting their assets into entities where they could take some discounts based on the valuation of those, depending on how they're structured. Those are the, the two main strategies I've seen. Great, thanks. That's, um, that's helpful because it's, it's hard to sometimes think about, you know, the future and what that means for mm -hmm. philanthropy. And, you know, we often, talk to clients and and they want they are philanthropic and you know are just looking at different ways of giving and so it's important to for them to look forward and see what's coming 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 down the pipe um, well, oh and and i should i should say too because it, it was on one of the the slides there are some more uh you know i focus this presentation on relatively straightforward strategies for philanthropic giving um, but but there are some that are a little more complex, such as um, using annuities. I think there was a charitable gift annuity that was, uh, you know, one of the images that I found as I was building these slides. There are strategies like that too that can um, provide a benefit to a donor, for example, of some sort of income stream, while also giving them, you know, in an example like that, probably a substantial enough charitable gift that they can you know, benefit from the tax deduction for that also. So, so there are other strategies that, that can make sense for people, um, even in addition to the ones that we discussed. Yeah, and we find that like the deferred gift annuity is sort of the vehicle that um, many people in Montana use for taking advantage of the Montana Endowment Tax Credit because it's a planned gift. Um, 
I did have another question. Oh, I, my question was, um, we didn't touch on this at all, but I know there's this ACE legislation around donor advised funds. Um, have, I'm not sure if you've sort of looked into any of that or, um, but I'm really intrigued on sort of um, the impact on philanthropy. I mean, we know you mentioned like donor advised funds are often held by Schwab or Vanguard or something, but it's also community foundations. I know, um, you know, Montana Community Foundation, we hold some donor advised funds, Whitefish Community Foundation. Um, and I think the initial like intent of the law, right, was for these community organizations to um, help donors um, make decisions about where they could be impactful in the community. But then we have billions of dollars being held by the Vanguard and Schwab and um, these commercial entities that um, maybe aren't necessarily engaged with their donors in those conversations. And so I know the ACE legislation might change some of that. Um, I'm just curious as your thoughts on um, how that will impact um, people that are using um, DAFs to sort of um, put money into, especially from like private foundations and other things. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's hard to know some of what the effect would be like, like I mentioned earlier, you know, there, there was some speculation that the changes in, in the tax code from the 2017 law might, might have a fairly substantial impact on charitable giving. And, and I think I, I know some people, you know, it sometimes takes a few years to, to really get into some of the details of it. Uh, that there's been some speculation that the, the the organizations that receive the charitable gifts, some of them might be more favored now than others if it, it's really just the, you know, the much wealthier taxpayers um, who are incentivized to give. I, I think I saw one study um, that arts organizations and, and universities tend to be the primary recipients of, of the wealthiest individuals where it's more kind of middle or upper middle class Americans that give the most to local um, entities and could there be some shifting even if the total charitable dollars remains the same or, or increases and I think that's still somewhat being studied but to get to your question so I, I'd be I'd be a little um, hesitant to speculate what might happen but but I think you're you're right that um, you know some there, there's certainly a, a difference in practice, I think, between what you're describing of uh, a community foundation that's working with with a donor to where the emphasis is really on that, you know, making a, a an impactful charitable gift and helping to guide individuals in those decisions in, in a structure that that can be more convenient or simple than a private foundation versus an, an investment and entity or company of some sort that that's probably focused more on you know, the, the return on the investment rather than the, the charitable side of that. So yeah, that that is very interesting. Because like I, I mentioned, I know, um, you know, like even just some of those those organizations that, that you mentioned have have really seen an uptick in, in those donor advised funds uh, in recent years and, and even leading up to the, the 2017 changes. So yeah, I'll be very curious to see that too. There's, it's interesting, there's a lot of articles out there right now about sort of the division between the philanthropy community on whether they support or against the ACE legislation. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what happens. Mm -hmm.